Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining the session on contract transparency. Uh, not sure how we're doing on attendees right now, but I think we'll just go ahead. So I'm now sharing a screen with you of the ground rules. You've probably all already seen these, but just please familiarize yourself. Um, this webinar will be provided with simultaneous interpretation. So please, could you click the world icon at the bottom of the screen and select your language room? Uh, we'll be translating to English, French, or Portuguese. Um, please, could you chat directly to the host, which is the Publish What You Pay Secretariat in the drop down menu of the chat if you have any technical difficulties? And please feel free to introduce yourselves using the chat. Uh, select to all panelists and attendees in the drop down box. Um, please use the separate Q&A section to ask your questions to the panelists. And if someone has asked a question that you're interested to hear the answer to, then please vote for it using the thumbs up icon. Um, I can also mention that by participating in this webinar, you are agreeing to uphold the code of conduct which will be being shared in the chat box now, if you could just familiarize yourself with this, if you haven't already. And just please note that this webinar will be recorded and a link will be made available shortly after. And if we're all happy, I'm gonna hand over to Charles Wanguhu, who will be moderating this session. Thank you, everyone. Hi all, um, welcome to this uh, very interesting session on the Contract Transparency Panel. Um, I want to welcome everyone across the continent. I think, uh, I think for some people it might be still good morning, so good morning, good afternoon, um, and some, some might be almost evening, so good evening to all of you as well. Um, today's panel um, on contract transparency, um, and the title is Why Does It Matter and What Can We Do Together to Implement a global norm of contract disclosure across the continent. Um, I think a lot of the, the attendees of this panel will agree that contract disclosure is sort of critical in the extractive sector space. Uh, more importantly, it's just sort of a recognition that if we, we can't speak of benefit sharing um, or revenue you know, management without looking at contracts and ensuring that contracts from the get-go are signed in, in ways that benefit uh, natural resource rich countries. Um, again, um, there it has been quite a significant progress um, on this front with the EITI, for example, pushing for contract disclosure in their new standard. Um, and in 2020, as you all know, I think majority of us on the panel are Publish What You Pay uh, members. And so in 2020, Publish What You Pay launched the Disclosure Deal, the global campaign for global transparency that is ongoing with key members of Publish What You Pay currently implementing it. Um, I don't want to spend too much time uh, boring you down with details um, as the panel awaits you. Um, so we'll start, um, and I think our first panelist is Christian Muenzo. I hope, Muenzo, I hope I, I pronounced that correctly. Um, and Christian is from Congo, Brazzaville. Um, and he was previously the CSO representative on the EITI board. Um, and he's worked broadly in the human rights sector and has done quite extensive work in the tax justice and the revenue sharing space um, in the extractive sector. Um, so without much further ado, I'd like to invite Christian um, to make his presentation. Christian. Merci. Um... La question qui m'est posée ici, c'est en quoi est-ce que euh, cette question de transparence des contrats est-elle euh, vraiment utile, elle est importante. Elle est vraiment importante, d'ailleurs je vous remercie. Elle est importante parce que euh, grâce à la transparence des contrats, euh, on peut renforcer la redevabilité des États et des entreprises, on peut améliorer la transparence des modalités de mise en œuvre des projets, on peut gérer équitablement les ressources naturelles dans l'intérêt euh, des citoyens. Partant de l'exemple du Congo, qui est le pays que je connais le mieux et dont la réalité n'est pas différente de ce qui se passe euh, au Gabon, au Tchad, au Cameroun, 
Et après des décennies d'exploitation pétrolière, sa situation socio-économique est demeurée précaire. Pourtant, le pays a engrangé des revenus importants, comme la plupart des pays riches en ressources naturelles, mais pauvres. Autre élément du contexte, le pays a connu une période faste avec des excédents budgétaires à cet égard. Un compte séquestre avait même été, euh, comme qui dirait, créé pour les générations futures. Et ce compte, entre 2013 et 2018, a reçu près de 14 000 milliards de francs CFA, à ce jour à la limite volatilisée. Cependant, au cours de la même période, le gouvernement a accentué les pratiques des préfinancements pétroliers avec les traders, les traders et la Chine, ce qui a eu pour conséquence un nouvel endettement massif du pays, euh, dette devenue insoutenable, le contraignant à négocier un programme avec le FMI. De plus, les pratiques euh, de détournement de fonds publics et de corruption et en cours dans le pays ont servi à renforcer l'état de pauvreté des populations qui ne profitent pas des revenus de la manne pétrolière. Alors, pour illustration, il existe toute une littérature abondante sur le Congo et peut-être des pays alentour, une littérature abondante en matière de mauvaise gouvernance, de détournement de fonds et de corruption, de conflits d'intérêts. Euh, les rapports de Global Witness, la déclaration de Berne, pour ne citer que cela, témoignent régulièrement du contexte dans lequel des accords, voire des contrats peu bénéfiques sont signés, mais qui ne profitent pas euh, à l'État, mais à des individus dans le système de gouvernance publique. Donc, aujourd'hui, en rapport avec la manne pétrolière, le gouvernement s'est donné la perspective de déployer une politique de développement des infrastructures. Ainsi, de nombreuses initiatives ont été prises et d'importantes ressources ont été investies dans des projets de construction au cours des 15 dernières années, dans le but officiel de doter le pays en infrastructures. Si les montants de récupération de certains projets sont connus, les coûts prévisionnels de réalisation de ces projets sont demeurés secrets, pire, les modalités de remboursement de ces investissements sont adossées sur la récupération de la part d'huile de l'État et sur des régimes fiscaux et douaniers particulièrement dérogatoires en compensation des préfinancements. La récupération des coûts d'investissement se fait au détriment de l'État, ce qui constitue un manque à gagner pour le pays. Dans un tel environnement, la divulgation de tout contrat pétrolier, minier, etc. devient un élément crucial de la gouvernance parce qu'elle permet aux populations d'accéder aux informations essentielles d'un projet engageant les ressources pétrolières et minières, de comprendre les obligations auxquelles sont tenus les gouvernements et les investisseurs, en assurer le suivi et exiger la rédevabilité. Cette transparence est donc opportune car elle conduit nécessairement au respect des obligations contractuelles avec pour impact la redistribution équitable des revenus issus de l'activité extractive à travers l'amélioration des conditions de vie des populations. Ensuite, la transparence des contrats a un enjeu pour le Congo du fait que le pays dispose d'un cadre législatif récurrent que les contrats signés entre l'État et les entreprises pétrolières soient rendus publics. Ces contrats ont un caractère de loi, suivent le même parcours législatif depuis leur validation par le Parlement jusqu'à la publication au journal officiel. Le nouveau Code des hydrocarbures, euh, notamment, systématise leur publication en son article 11. La question de la transparence des contrats, au Congo en tout cas, ne se pose plus en tant que telle puisque ces contrats sont des sens publics. Cependant, les problèmes résident plutôt dans l'existence d'un nombre important d'annexes au contrat, ainsi que les accords particuliers et les accords commerciaux impliquant une même mise sur les ressources et les revenus de l'État tirés de l'exploitation des matières premières. Ces avenants et accords commerciaux demeurent secrets et inaccessibles au public. La demande donc, de publication des accords commerciaux et des remboursements irrelatifs est de nature à étendre la redevabilité des contrats qui non seulement contribuent à accroître la dette extérieure du Congo, mais aussi n'améliore pas le quotidien des populations. Il est donc, dans ces conditions, indispensable pour refléter l'esprit du Code de transparence de 2017 que les informations relatives à ces accords soient rendues disponibles et accessibles au public. De plus, la transparence pour... Euh, la transparence ne peut pas être, comment dire, un objectif. Ces accords doivent être également audités. Un autre enjeu, c'est la faible capacité des gouvernements, des gouvernants à, à négocier des contrats équilibrés bénéfiques à l'économie nationale. Ensuite, la limitation des revenus de l'État par certaines dispositions contractuelles. Il s'agit par exemple du faible niveau de la redevance minière proportionnelle, du faible pourcentage du profit hall de l'État, des difficultés d'évaluer les coûts d'investissement. 
euh, évidemment, il est souvent arrivé que les entreprises se remboursent des coûts d'investissement pour lesquels les États n'ont pas du tout la capacité de pouvoir évaluer exactement euh, à, à quel niveau effectivement ces, 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 ces coûts se situent, euh, que, que, comment est-ce que c'est euh, l'entreprise qui qui euh, se rembourse ses coûts a, a pu être capable de pouvoir euh, euh, statuer, et mettre en place euh, des coûts parfois qui sont des coûts exorbitants. Et aujourd'hui, euh, le Congo fait partie des pays euh, qui, en matière euh, de publication des contrats, euh, publient la plupart, la majorité des contrats de partage de production qui sont signés. Ces, ces contrats sont dans le domaine public. Depuis 2018, on peut enregistrer donc des progrès en matière de divulgation des dix contrats avec leur mise en ligne sur les sites officiels de, des ministères, notamment le ministère des Finances, le site de l'ITIE. Le Congo met à jour régulièrement euh, euh, comment dire, euh, son journal officiel qui publie effectivement euh, l'ensemble euh, des contrats qui, euh, sont, euh, qui passent par le processus euh, législatif et donc qui sont publiés au journal officiel. Ensuite, euh, le Congo a également... Euh, euh, créer un cadastre pétrolier, minier et forestier euh, euh, qui lui permet aujourd'hui euh, d'alimenter une plateforme qu'on appelle Cisco et Cispace et qui met euh, en jeu une importante centralisation des informations liées aux permis et aux contrats. Cette divulgation des contrats devient une norme dans la pratique et non plus, euh, comme qui dirait, une, une exception. Et dans ce contexte, on peut dire que la coalition publique qu'on paye a joué un rôle important D'autant que son plaidoyer, du point de vue stratégique, a permis de pouvoir profiter d'au moins deux ou trois opportunités qui ont permis effectivement au gouvernement de pouvoir avancer sur la question de la transparence du pétrole. La première opportunité, c'est le plaidoyer que publie ce qu'on paye à déployé pour obtenir que l'annulation de la dette du Congo dans le cadre de l'initiative Pays pauvres très endettés soit conditionnée à une amélioration euh, et une prise des réformes en ce qui concerne la gouvernance du secteur extractif. Et parmi ces réformes, effectivement, euh, le gouvernement s'est engagé à accentuer le processus euh, qui est lié à la mise à disposition euh, des contrats, des contrats pétroliers. Ensuite, euh, publier ce que vous payez euh, a également utilisé le, les différents processus de validation pour pouvoir obtenir que le gouvernement euh, mette en place tout ce qu'il fallait entreprendre pour s'assurer que, euh, du point de vue euh, de la transparence sur toute la chaîne de la valeur et tout, on est capable et tout, de pouvoir obtenir des résultats. À ce stade, euh, c'est profitant du processus de la validation que euh, Publier ce que vous payez a lancé le plaidoyer sur l'adoption euh, du code de transparence et de responsabilité dans la gestion des finances publiques. Et cette initiative a été lancée en 2010 et en 2017, euh, le Congo a validé une loi portant code de transparence relatif à la transparence et à la responsabilité dans la gestion des finances publiques. La particularité de ce code, c'est que ce code consacre les principes de légalité, de publicité des opérations financières de l'État, l'information du public, l'obligation de divulgation des concessions de services, des concessions de services publics, les permis de recherche, les accords de financement, l'exigence de mise à la disposition de la presse des documents relatifs à l'information financière. Ensuite, et je pense une autre opportunité que ce que vous payez au niveau du Congo a utilisé, a été évidemment le fait de suivre en particulier la relation que le FMI a entrepris avec le gouvernement du Congo à partir du moment où le Congo a demandé un programme avec le FMI depuis, depuis deux ou trois ans. Et dans le cadre de ce programme, euh, le Congo s'est retrouvé avec de nouveau un endettement massif et euh, pour obtenir que, euh, évidemment, euh, la situation de cessation de paiement dans laquelle le pays se trouve soit levée, euh, le FMI a apporté effectivement euh, son appui avec euh, 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 la, la facilité élargie de crédit. Et dans le cadre, justement, de la négociation de cette facilité élargie de crédit, euh, publier ce que vous payez à une fois de plus, mise en place un ensemble de conditionnalités pour obtenir que, euh, évidemment, sans ces conditionnalités, en particulier les aspects qui sont liés à la transparence des revenus, la transparence des contrats, euh, vus comme étant des jalons euh, pour le suivi et l'évaluation de la facilité élargie de crédit, ça, ça a aidé, ça a permis effectivement euh, au gouvernement de pouvoir pousser sur l'agenda qui est lié à la transparence des contrats. 
Dans ce contexte, euh, on peut dire aujourd'hui que euh, la transparence des contrats est une réalité, mais ça reste que euh, c'est une, une transparence qui a encore des défis. Et parmi ces défis, euh, on pourrait euh, parler de la disponibilité des informations euh, sur euh, en particulier les avenants. Parce que ce qu'il y a, c'est que le Congo euh, 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 publie les contrats de partage de production, mais ces contrats de partage de production sont adossés à, à des avenants, à des addendas, etc. Et ces avenants euh, ne sont pas toujours disponibles. Et ça constitue véritablement un défi euh, parce que, euh, évidemment, euh, lorsque euh, le contrat, euh, comment dire, euh, euh, lorsque le contrat lui-même n'est pas, n'est pas, n'est pas, n'est pas un tout, lorsque le contrat est accompagné par euh, des addendums qui ne sont pas disponibles, on a des difficultés à pouvoir les lire. Et donc, de ce point de vue, euh, parmi les défis, il y a donc l'accumulation donc, de ces amendements au CPP qui rendent leur lisibilité difficile, voire complexe. Il y a euh, le fait qu'à euh, côté euh, des contrats de partage de production, il y a également euh, des accords particuliers, des, euh, euh, des accords qui sont spécifiques, euh, euh, on, on les appelle parfois des accords stratégiques, que le pays a signé avec, par exemple, la Chine, avec les, tra les traders, ces accords-là ne sont pas disponibles. Euh, ils sont à la limite même euh, secrets, alors que, euh, évidemment, euh, ces accords contiennent des informations qui sont des informations clés. Et en principe, euh, si on parle de transparence de, de, de contrat, euh, évidemment, euh, ce type d'accord devrait absolument euh, être aussi accessible dans le domaine public. Euh, L'un des défis, encore qu'on pourrait citer, c'est la question de l'accessibilité à, à, à tout le public à ces CPP. Parce que c'est vrai qu'il euh, existe une base de données où les contrats sont publiés, mais leur accès n'est pas cependant gratuit, euh, comme le voudrait le principe de transparence des contrats. Parce que bon, euh, tout le monde n'a pas toujours Internet, tout le monde n'a pas toujours euh, l'électricité pour être capable effectivement euh, d'aller sur euh, les sites et pour, pour, pouvoir, pour pouvoir lire. Euh, J'ai parlé euh, aussi euh, de la question de l'exhaustivité, n'est-ce pas, euh, des dix contrats. Euh, évidemment, euh, euh, le but même de la transparence des contrats, c'est qu'il faut que ces contrats soient disponibles dans des versions qui soient des versions lisibles, des versions compréhensibles euh, et, et, et exhaustives aussi à moindre coût. Euh, ensuite, et... Euh, euh, un défi qui n'est pas un, un défi euh, mineur, c'est le fait également qu'aujourd'hui, euh, euh, l'accord avec la Chine, euh, et je reviens là-dessus parce que c'est une question qui est importante, l'accord avec la Chine et les traders est au centre aujourd'hui des négociations avec le FMI, explique d'ailleurs les différents blocages que le FMI a euh, avec le gouvernement du Congo, parce qu'il y a des difficultés à accéder à ce type d'accords commerciaux, d'autant qu'effectivement, euh, euh, il s'est établi dans ce type d'accord euh, des, des, des pratiques euh, qui, qui, qui ne sont pas du tout accessibles au commun, au commun de, euh, euh, des Congolais, d'autant qu'on ne sait pas qu'est-ce qu'il y a dans cet accord, mais pourtant, cet accord, le gouvernement n'arrive pas à accéder à l'ensemble des ressources euh, qui ont été hypothéquées à travers euh, comment dire, les remboursements qui sont faits. Euh, une, un autre des défis, c'est le fait qu'aujourd'hui, euh, le Congo a adopté un code de transparence et de responsabilité dans la gestion des finances publiques, mais il se trouve que euh, ce code de transparence qui est un code en vigueur, euh, les textes d'application qui doivent permettre à ce code d'être effectif ne sont pas encore euh, adoptés depuis de nombreuses années. Et donc là, à ce niveau, euh, il y a un appel pour que, euh, évidemment, euh, des lois qui sont prises, des lois qui sont prises euh, telles que euh, euh, des, des lois, euh, mais euh, des textes d'application ne suivent pas et parfois peuvent euh, empêcher effectivement la mise en œuvre euh, des engagements euh, des États. Voilà ce que je peux dire à titre introductif euh, à travers cette, euh, ma, cette présentation. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, that was a brilliant presentation. Um, and you've saved me about 30 seconds to quickly summarize um, what you said. I think some key highlights, um, I think everyone needs to take home is sort of 
looking at the loans for infrastructure and uh, the importance of these also being made public. Um, looking at, uh, and this is an issue that we face across all coalitions, the issue of contracts being public but annexes not being public. And the, the centrality of the annexes, you know, sort of changing the main contract, but those not being made public, again, is sort of very critical. And it was a very good point um, that Christian, you made. Um, and I guess the other issue of IMF conditionalities. So basically pushing governments to disclose. Um, so trying to reach a point where it goes beyond conditionalities to sort of proactive disclosure, I think is, is something uh, critical. Um, and the big issue of just accessibility, um, the idea of secret agreements that are not in public, including those uh, that include China and the accessibility of contracts uh, more broadly, where it's not an issue of affordability that they should actually be public. Um, I don't want to take too much time. I want to go uh, quickly to the next speaker, um, who's Gay Odenez. Gay Odenez is the head of contracts. Um, is is a is an EATI Asia director, but also is a lead on um, on contract disclosure. Um, and so, Gay, without much further ado, please um, you can commence your presentation. Thank you very much, Charles, and I hope you can hear me very well. Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to present the requirements of EITI on contract uh, disclosure. As I'm sure all of you know, this contract took, uh, this requirement took effect um, on the 1st of January this year. So there's really a lot of interest um, in terms of understanding exactly what the standard uh, requires. So I, I do have a presentation and I would like to request um, Sandrine or anyone from the Publish What You Pay Secretariat to, to post that. Yes, thank you for that. Um, maybe we can move to the next slide. So this is just a snapshot of um, a global overview of contract disclosure in EITI countries. Um, I won't discuss this in detail, um, but you can check our website if you want to have more information. And I know that Energy I also keeps a, a, an updated database um, listing the, the countries that have disclosed um, partially or all of their contracts. So just to let you know that you, we do have that information um, for you to refer to. Um, next slide. Right, so um, I mean, the main um, point of my presentation is to really give you an not just an overview, but a detailed discussion of what exactly does the EITI standard require um, in terms of uh, contract transparency, which is covered by our requirement 2.4. So um, as you know, full disclosure of all contracts and licenses that are granted, entered into, or amended from the 1st of January 2021 should be fully disclosed. Um, and this includes full text, annexes, um, relevant documents, material exploration permits. Now, I think um, Christian's presentation earlier um, did a very good job in really emphasizing the importance of annexes. And I will come back to that issue uh, later on. But let me unpack this requirement further. So when we talk about full text, um, it means that the, the requirement is for the actual contract to be disclosed without redacting or without omitting any provision. So when we were having this discussion on um, you know, what is the extent of disclosure that is being required, we heard a lot of questions about, well, what about commercially sensitive information? Or what about you know, information that, is, that should be kept confidential? Um, as stipulated in the contract. So the EITI board had a very thorough discussion on that issue and the interpretation and the intent of the requirement is for the full text to be disclosed, which means that there is no more room for reduction under the current requirement. And summaries of contracts, you know, publication of summaries of contracts will not will not meet the requirement. So I just want to make that clear um, because we have seen how um, this is still an issue among many countries who say that they are partially disclosing contracts, but are still keeping some um, stipulations in contracts confidential. So just to emphasize that that partial disclosure will not meet the requirement. Um, and then annexes and relevant documents. So Christian um, very brilliantly pointed out the importance of this earlier. 
Um, so under the standard, it's not just the main contract that is required to be disclosed, all the annexes or all the relevant documents that would help you in understanding the contracts should be disclosed as well. So first of all, let me just take a step back. What are we talking about when we, we talk of contracts and licenses? So this refers to all agreements that govern the terms for the exploitation of oil, gas, and mineral resources in a country. Now, we all know that you know, the terminology could vary from country to country. It could be you know, PSCs, investment agreements, and so forth. The nomenclature is not important here as long as it defines the terms um, and conditions for extraction. Now, the annexes, um, as Christian pointed out earlier, is important to understand the stipulations in the main contract. Now, in every jurisdiction, um, annexes could be different. Um, and sometimes this is not very well defined in the contract itself, but are considered as annexes. Um, the guidance that has been provided by the EITI board here is for the multi-stakeholder groups in each country to have a discussion about what constitutes as annexes and relevant documents that would help them understand the main contract. So there is no hard and fast rule here. Um, the, the recommendation is for countries to be guided by the existing requirements of the standard. For example, the standard requires disclosure of social and environmental expenditures, infrastructure and barter, barter agreements, um, you know, other obligations of, of, the, of the company uh, to the state or even to the local community. So that's a discussion that the MSG has to make in determining what are the relevant annexes. Um, and then there's also a requirement to um, disclose material exploration permits. Now, we do know that in many jurisdictions, you know, exploration permits could be standard, but at the same time, they could also contain important um, obligations on the part of the companies. There's also a feedback from, from some countries that it might not be administratively realistic or practical to disclose all exploration permits. So again, um, there's an obligation for the MSG to discuss what are the material exploration permits that need to be disclosed. There is also a requirement to publish a list of all active contracts and licenses. So earlier I talked about disclosing the contract itself in addition to that, a list of all active contracts and licenses should also be um, disclosed, including expiration permits. Um, and the, re the rationale for this um, requirement is that it is not always the case that the citizens know exactly what are the contracts out there. Um, and we do see a lot of, um, of that, you know, that problem happening where countries do not even know if what they have already disclosed is actually comprehensive. And, you know, Partial disclosure of some contracts um, would give very limited value to contract transparency if you're not disclosing all contracts. Um, and again, you, you know, uh, uh, an important use of this requirement is to also help tax agencies know who they should be assessing for tax payments. Um, and so having a list of all active contracts um, would be useful for that purpose. Um, countries or MSGs are also required to develop a work plan include plans to address barriers. Um, and I will touch on this later on as to what kind of barriers we have seen so far. And then it's also important to document the government's policy on disclosure of contracts and licenses. And here, the important thing to note is for the country to also assess whether the policy is consistent with the practice. Because we have seen countries where despite the existence of um, you know, commitments to contract disclosure, none of the contracts have been disclosed, or the opposite, where despite the absence of a legal restriction to disclose, um, the country is still also not disclosing contracts. So um, can we move to the next slide, please? So what are the lessons that we have learned so far? Um, if you will recall, the requirement on contract transparency was reflected in 2019 EITI standard, but this has been an encouragement under the 2016 standard. Um, and you know, in the course of four or five years um, that since it has been encouraged and now that it's being required, um, we can see that there's there has been a lot of progress. More than half of countries now um, in the EITI have disclosed at least some or all contracts. And this is to us an indication of an appreciation for the importance of contract transparency. 
However, um, we need to emphasize the challenges still remain. Um, there are still a lot of legal obstacles that have been raised um, by countries. I already mentioned earlier, you know, allegations of commercial sensitivity. Um, other, there are some legislations in some countries that prohibit disclosure of, of contracts. Still some issues on political commitment. Um, I guess the universal challenge is on technical capacity to understand the contracts, make use of the information, and also to understand just the benefits of the contract. Um, we have heard also, you know, feedback from other countries to help them um, in the messaging. How do you link contract transparency to the wider reforms? Because obviously, we do not um, want to disclose contract for the sake of, of disclosure. And then I already mentioned earlier um, issues around comprehensive uh, disclosure. But let me just maybe mention some of the progress that we have seen. Um, so during the last two years, we have seen governments from Equatorial Guinea, Mauritania, and, and Ukraine officially disclosing contracts for the first time. Last year, Iraq committed the contracts disclosure. We have seen good examples of systematic disclosure of contracts in Mexico, Ghana, Armenia, and similar progress have been seen or underway in Nigeria, DRC, Republic of Congo, etc. So, um, but the more encouraging reaction um, we have seen has come from governments um, such as Sierra Leone and Zambia, which we know have started to examine the link between contract disclosure and wider national reforms such as domestic resource mobilization. So I guess the key takeaway there is that a lot of progress has been made, but a lot of work still needs to be done. And again, we think that the next frontier is not just the disclosure of the main contracts, but also the disclosure of the annexes and the relevant um, provisions. So I also want to highlight um, two things regarding this requirement. First, it is important, uh, it is also required for countries to disclose the amendments um, of the contracts. So you know that the, the, although the coverage of the requirement is um, for contracts from executed from January 1, 2021 onwards, if the contracts are amended, that means that the entire contract, even though they were executed before January 1st, should also be disclosed. And this is very important now, given that we are seeing a lot of renegotiations happening uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So just to flag that that's another important um, aspect of the, of the requirement as well, where amendment of contracts before 2021 would trigger the disclosure of the entire contract. Um, and of course, you know, contracts executed before 2021 are still encouraged uh, to be disclosed under the standard. So um, for the next few minutes of my presentation, I want to touch a bit about uh, sorry, if we can just go back to the to the previous slide, please. I just want to touch a bit about the role of civil society. I'm not going to elaborate on this. We do have um, a lot of civil society panelists who I know are, are more well placed to discuss this. But maybe just to see uh, or to explain how we have seen um, the CSO's role play uh, in, in this important agenda at the EITI level. Um, first of all, advocacy is very important. Um, CSOs have been instrumental in making contract transparency possible in many countries. An example we can cite is one in, in DRC, where um, CSO advocacy, including from members of Publish Social Pay Co Coalition, helped in the disclosure of a mining contract that the citizens wanted to understand um, what the fiscal regime was. So, you know, ma by making it the point that this becomes an important agenda in MSG discussions, um, having, you know, a, a really targeted campaign on this, um, you know, online press releases and so forth. Um, that, that very concerted effort led to a disclosure of an important uh, mining contract um, in that country. Second, it's really, um, we really encourage civil society to demand information. I already mentioned in terms of annexes, full contracts and amendments. An example I can cite here is one that they did in the Philippines where I am from, where civil society really made it a point to demand for the publication of um, um, agreements with, with indigenous peoples and you know, assessments of environmental uh, performance of companies um, and made that a precondition for the publication of the EITI report. So I think you know, that's one example of what how civil society can leverage the EITI process and take advantage of your presence 
in the MSG um, to make sure that publication happens. Um, and lastly, one example, um, this, this, this one from the Lebanese Oil and Gas Initiative, um, they monitor um, the use of the contract, did some fiscal modeling, um, and then they disseminate the findings of the financial modeling exercise through their through a video that they uploaded on their Facebook, you know, to get a wider reach. Um, and and the, they did this precisely for the purpose of explaining to the public what are the benefits that they stand to gain, or you know, what are the projected benefits from um, from an oil contract. So um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So what to expect? What's next now that this has become a requirement? So from our end at the EITI Secretariat, we really want to continue enhancing political support. Um, we have established uh, last year a contract transparency network of governments. Um, a lot of countries from Africa are taking part of taking part in this where you know there are technical discussions and also discussions of how to address challenges. Um, we are also stepping up our communications plan just to increase more awareness on contract transparency and also you know just continue debunking myths on um, perceived risks on, on contract disclosure which as we know um, could, could easily be um, countered or um, explained. And then we are continuing our technical support for countries. Um, we're supporting um, Latin America now, for example, in doing a comprehensive mapping, um, specific studies to address legal barriers. We're developing a guidance note that we intend to publish next quarter. Um, and then, yeah, just in, you know, facilitating more peer learning across countries, across regions, more engagement with partners, and also keeping uh, watching the space for some emerging issues like what are the links of contract transparency to energy transition? And we've also had some discussions in some countries about disclosing not just the, the production contracts, but also the sales contracts. But that's something that, you know, as, as I've said, is an emerging issue that we are keeping an eye on um, and, and um, would also want to get your feedback on um, in the future. So I will uh, end um, at this point and I'm happy to, to respond to questions either on the chair and thank you. Thanks for that, and also thanks for keeping time. Um, I don't want to take too much time trying to summarize what you said. I think I think you hit a lot of the points on the head. I mean, just starting off by saying summary of contracts will not suffice is sort of a critical point to make for, I mean, for the EITI standard and for a lot of uh, the implementing countries. And I think a lot of uh, our CSO colleagues on the call will probably uh, be looking to that. Um, the issue of active contracts and licenses um, and just overall, just sort of the acknowledgement that a lot of progress has been made, but there's still a lot more uh, to happen. Um, I like the point about amendments to contracts, ensuring that now uh, it's, it's sort of seen as a loophole before that only contracts beyond January 2021, but indicating where contracts are amended, then this actually contract should come in uh, under the standard. I think that was critical. And lastly, just sort of the centrality of uh, civil society um, and the use of the multi-stakeholder group uh, in terms of lobbying for uh, pushing for more information. I think you use a Filipino example of uh, the indigenous agreements and environmental report. I think that was that, that was pretty critical. Um, and the challenge that you, you left us with around cross-learning, learning, learning uh, between uh, partners. Um, I want to stop there and invite Rob. Uh, Rob Pittman is uh, from NRGI, the Natural Resource Governance Institute. Yeah. Um, and he's been working on contracts for a long period now. Um, Rob, please take it. Thanks very much, Charles. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, great honor to be talking to this group. Um, I would like to build on Christian and Gay's points by thinking about the actions that we can take collectively as a global coalition to further build this norm of contract transparency. Um, and in order to do this, I'm going to split this, um, this presentation up into three parts. Um, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about how far we've come. Next, I'd like to say why we still have work to do. And then 
finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about what that work might be. So um, let's let's start and let's get dug in. Um, the good news is that we're we're standing on very strong foundations. Um, in addition to the new EITI requirement that Gay just outlined, um, progress on transparency has been absolutely solid. Um, we're seeing progress um, in the private sector. We're seeing progress um, at the in the international community. We're seeing progress among governments, um, and you know this this is this is really really strong. So just to, just to give you um, some examples here, in the private sector, there are now um, over 20 companies that have made public statements supporting contract transparency. And industry groups like the ICMM and the B team have um, registered their support for the issue. Um, within the international community, it's not just the EITI. We're also talking about the IMF, the International Bar Association, the OECD, the UN. Um, Financing institutions such as the IFC and the EBRD require contract transparency for lending in the sector. So that's a huge amount of um, progress there. So what has this meant for host governments? It means that more and more governments around the world are disclosing. Um, as Gay pointed out, we keep a tracker of these things at NRGI. And according to our tracker, there are now 49 countries that have officially disclosed at least one extractive industry contract. Um, and 31 with laws in place making this uh, mandatory. So that's a big change and a really impressive amount of progress. And as a result of all of this progress, there are more um, public contracts out there than ever before. Um, another website that NRGI helps manage along with a host of other partners, so many that I can't name them all just right now, um, called resourcecontracts.org is the world's largest repository of um, extractive industry contracts. Now that, that website now contains over 2,500 documents from 97 countries. So that just shows you how far we've come. So um, why, why is it that we still have more work to do? Why can't, we just, why can't we just pat each other on the back and say, job well done? Well, I'm gonna give you three reasons why. Um, Firstly, um, the new rules that we have, particularly those in EITI, they do present us with opportunities to consolidate our games, but they also present us with risks, um, specifically the risk of an implementation gap, which I think that Christian actually mentioned. Um, the new EITI requirement will mean that many countries around the world will have to disclose contracts for the first time. In Africa, we're talking about 10 EITI implementing countries. Around the world, we're talking about at least 17. And um, a failure to follow through with these countries um, will only give an opportunity to detractors who want to claim that disclosing contracts is too hard. And we also have to recognize that, that making these countries disclose um, during this time of the global pandemic is only going to be more difficult. So we really have, we really have the challenge um, set against us. So that's the first point. The second point um, why, we, why we can't be complacent is that several important contractual do documents still remain secret. Um, while many countries around the, the world have disclosed some contracts, the number of countries that have disclosed all of their contracts is actually very few. Um, looking at Africa again, um, we see that while 17 countries have disclosed some contracts, only four have disclosed everything in both sectors. So there's still a long, long way to go. And finally, the reason why we can't be complacent is that contract transparency is important now as it ever has been. The, the coronavirus pandemic and the energy transition are bringing increased uncertainty to the extractive industries worldwide. And in this context, it's essential that we, um, we can understand these contracts, we understand the terms to understand how external shocks like these will impact national assets and, and the benefits and um, challenges that they bring to citizens. Um, what's more, um, as companies and governments revisit their contractual terms, um, make amendments, as Gay pointed out, um, we're going to need to access these amendments, these alterations, so that we can understand how legal frameworks are changing. 
Um, and again, as, as Christian pointed out, we need to know this because we need to know are governments offering overly um, generous incentives? Um, are parties to negotiations negotiating for the interests of the narrow um, few um, at the expense of the broader group of the country's citizens? So this is why we cannot be complacent. So what comes next? How do we as a movement avoid backsliding and maintain the strong momentum that exists around contract transparency? Well, I've got three suggestions for you here. First, we need to do as much as we can to keep contract transparency at the top of the good governance agenda. This is why the Disclose the Deal campaign is so important. Um, now is the time to fill in the gaps and get the job done. And um, I've got three ideas of how we can keep contract transparency at the top of the good governance agenda. Um, First, we need to make sure that EITI implementing countries around the world promptly meet their commitments to establish contract transparency um, um, for all contracts granted, entered into, or amended from the 1st of January. Um, civil society needs to be using its seat at the table in EITI processes and in its engagement with governments and companies um, to keep it at the top of the agenda. We need to use important flashpoints um, and use these as leverage. And what I'm talk thinking about here, uh, moments such as the development of plans um, for disclosing contracts, which is mandatory within EITI, um, the development of lists of contracts. So each EITI process has to come up with a list of all of the contracts. Um, we need to be scrutinizing that list and making sure it includes all the documents that we're aware of and that we want to see public. And then finally, we need to be participating in consultations around contract transparency that EITI processes might be setting up um, to prepare for, for these changes. So that's the first thing, use EITI. The second, the second area where I think we can keep the, the contract transparency at the top of the agenda is by pushing companies to make public direct declarations in support of contract disclosure um, and to pledge to actively push for it in all of the countries that they operate in. Um, company statements are really important because they allow us to get beyond the constant finger pointing that we often see in many countries um, about who is preventing contract transparency, who is the obstacle of contract transparency. Because when a company says, they support contract transparency. We know it's the government that's holding up disclosures. So it's really, really helpful to get companies to say something in favor of this. Um, and we can help by convincing new countries to make public statements in favor of contract transparency. Um, and I think this is something where national coalitions um, are in a particularly strong position because a lot of the companies that haven't made um, statements yet uh, smaller companies that maybe are only active in one or two um, countries. And this is where I think that the relationships with um, National Publish What You Pay members um, will be really key. Um, another way that um, we can help um, make sure that companies um, push for contract transparency is holding them to the commitments that they've already made. Um, one example for this um, is in Myanmar where civil society set up an interview with um, local total officials, um, giving the total officials the opportunity to say that they supported contract transparency in the country. Um, finding country, companies that, that already support contract transparency and getting them to speak out like this is gonna be really, really helpful in, in sort of greasing the wheels um, on this issue. The third reason or way that we can keep contract transparency um, at the top of the agenda is by finding champions among regional institutions. So far, um, a lot of the support that we're seeing among international, from the international community has come from global institutions. Um, at, the, at the regional level, we're seeing some African institutions um, already on board. Um, for example, the, Le uh, the African Legal Support Facility um, is a partner on the resource projects um, or resource contracts um, platform. But more vocal um, support from these institutions can definitely help. And, and your engagement with these institutions will be key to making that, that come about. So this is my first, my first big bucket of what we can do next. 
how we keep um, the issue at the top of the good governance agenda. Now I've got two more. Um, the second one is that we need to change the way that we talk about contract transparency. Um, and I think that, you know, to explain this, let me take you on a little story. You know, contract transparency grew up at a time where prices were high and the extractive industries were broadly touted as a development opportunity. Um, now, as contract transparency enters its early adulthood, things are, things are different. The opportunities for development seem a little bit more uncertain um, and many global and national discussions um, in the extractive industry are focused on, at the moment, the, the downturn related to the pandemic, but then also the energy transition. And this means that the types of clauses that we talk about within contracts will change. Um, and the way that we need to make our case for publication needs to change. And if it doesn't, we're, we're, stuck, in, we're stuck in the past. Um, so I think, I think that clearly, the, um, you know, terms that we've done a lot of um, work on so far, things like fiscal terms, royalties, stabilization clauses, they're going to remain important. But other terms um, and other, other justifications for publishing contracts will, will come to the surface. So I'm thinking we're going to probably want to know more about force majeure and termination clauses. We're going to want to know about things like take or play clauses. We're going to want to know about SOE obligations that put public funding on the line um, for, for development of projects when we've got an energy transition um, that we've got to get through. Um, we're also probably going to want to know a bit more about dispute resolution provisions. So that's my second broad bucket of um, what we need to do next, change the way we talk about contract transparency. The final thing, um, I'm lucky um, because Gay and Christian have both alluded to this so far, but I want to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, we need to reflect on what contract documents we want to see in the public. Um, most um, contract transparency advocacy so far has focused on the main document, the main contract document that contains the terms associated with exploitation of resources. But as we've already learned, um, Additional annexes and associated documents um, are really important. Um, and these documents haven't been published with the same amount of frequency as the main contracts. They're now receiving the attention they deserve, but this might force us to, to change a little bit the way that we approach, um, approach um, you know, um, advocacy. So it might be necessary to engage with people we don't normally engage with, for example, local governments, um, who are holding community development agreements or infrastructure agreements. Um, and in some cases, we need to make concessions such as um, um, with, with, um, with indigenous groups, for example, there may be um, information, secret cultural heritage in these contracts that we need to be, you know, treat sensitively. So that's one area. Another, another area of, um, of, you know, thinking about what documents we want to see is we need to think a little bit about where the flows are um, in the financial flows are in each in each country. And one thing we're seeing at the moment is resource backed loans. Um, um, in Ghana and DRC, these issues have come up recently. And we've, we've seen that as a result of civil society advocacy, um, some of these documents are being published um, in DRC. Um, the metal coal contract was published um, just last year, and this is a really important development given that the publication of these loans at the moment remains rare. The final area um, that we might want to be thinking about looking to the future is um, the contracts that relate to the sale of oil, gas and minerals by government. Um, disclosure of these documents is currently not the norm, but the EITI um, standard now encourages um, state-owned um, enterprises and governments to be publishing these sales agreements. Um, and um, this, I think, is going to be a new frontier issue as we go ahead. Um, really delighted to, to be with you today, um, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion that follows. Um, I, hope, um, I hope that um, this stimulated some thoughts. Thanks very much. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, so you're just tittering on the time there, but uh, yeah, thanks for keeping within time. And I think you also raised, again, some critical points, reinforcing, I think, what Gay and, and, and Christian had, had basically been speaking about, 
um, just basically to highlight, and I think a key reminder that you, you, you've given us is around, yes, there's progress, but let's not be complacent. Um, to me, that's sort of a key takeaway point. I want to rush to our next presenter so that we can have enough time uh, for questions. Um, and our next presenter is Faith Noadeshe. I hope I, I, I got that, that correctly. Um, and Faith is the ED for the Center for Transparency and Advocacy in, in Nigeria, um, and also is a member of the Contract Transparency Network in Nigeria, and is the former National Coordinator of Publish What You Pay in Nigeria, as well as a former Civil Society representative on the EITI board. Um, Faith, welcome. As we say in Swahili Karibu, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, um, everyone. Good to see a lot of my friends around the, I, I can't say around the table now, maybe around the computers and devices that we are using to join the, this meeting. Um, thank you so much to the earlier presenters, Christian, uh, Gay, and Rob. My job is very simple. They just to share with us uh, what we have been doing in Nigeria on the issues around the contract transparency. So we have a partner, Foster, that is a facility for oil sector transparency and reform. They supported civil society to begin to advocate for the implementation of contract transparency way ahead of January 1st, uh, 2021. This um, was because of the fact that, you know, in 2016, when the anti-corruption summit held in London, our president went and made a lot of um, commitments around fighting for corruption. So the contract transparency sat very well into that agenda. And also the success around beneficial ownership advocacy in the country led, you know, set a kind of a, a stage for the contract transparency campaign in Nigeria. So um, what we did first was that Foster set up a team of five consultants. I was one of the consultants to uh, look at existing documents or scan the environment to see how prepared Nigeria is for the implementation of contract transparency. So a framework was developed from that research and then sent to civil society. Uh, civil society looked at that. We approached uh, civil society organizations that are working already in the extractive sector. About 25 organizations were identified, did a mapping of uh, civil society organizations. And we shared a lot of these documents. There were some training on uh, understanding contract transparency and understanding the EITI standard requirement 2.4. And so civil society in Nigeria set out and we came up with what we call the advocacy strategy. On the advocacy, sorry, I'm not able to share this, but I, I know that I have a presentation which will be shared to everybody. I've been having some quite of ICT uh, challenge. So civil society sat because it was at the height of the lockdown, uh, COVID, we went online and we developed uh, the advocacy uh, strategy, which was validated in August of 2000. Um, different civil society organizations identified what they were going to do. The main trust was that we needed to use a multi-stakeholder approach to be able to achieve uh, contract transparency in, in the country. And just while we were doing that, the Nigerian National Oil Company, the NNPC, signed on to the EITI as a supporting company. So that for us was an opportunity to push for the NNPC to become the champion of the, of the uh, implementation of contract transparency in the country. Because most of the issues really we have had with contracts with contract and the extractive industry had been centered around the NNPC as the national oil uh, company. So uh, going further, what we did was to really work very closely with media. We set up a network called ContraNet. ContraNet Full is a contract transparency network. So that's existing already in Nigeria. So the Contract Transparency Network 
engaged uh, media, you have media organizations. There's a media network on the extractive industries in Nigeria. They're a very strong partner on, on, on that uh, uh, network. So we, we went out and um, civil society, different civil society organizations came with the different ideas of what they needed to do. We found that contract transparency can be integrated into a lot of our work, having succeeded in the implementation of uh, beneficial ownership. So we use the same structures that were used in the advocacy for beneficial ownership to push for the advocacy for uh, contract transparency. We started a radio program. The radio program has been a huge success. Um, during the EITI uh, Contract Transparency Week, we we had as guests the Executive Secretary of the EITI International uh, Secretariat. We have also had uh, the Publisher to Pay International Secretariat to talk about disclosing the deal. So the, the radio program has really helped us to reach out. We have had um, civil society across the globe. Just uh, last week, we had Eric the Central African uh, coordinator to talk about the African conference, the publisher to pay African conference and talk about what Africa needs to do on contract transparency. I, I would say the, the radio program we, we run on a national radio uh, channel has been quite, has been a huge success. We, we get people calling in every day, asking questions. It's been one channel for us to uh, give information about what contract transparency is about and, and we like the feedback we are getting. Now, having succeeded in doing a lot of uh, communication, especially to, Ni to Nigerians understanding that, we thought about um, meeting with the legislature parliament because we have a very important uh, uh, document for the past 20 years, the petroleum industry bill has been in and out of parliament. And this particular parliament with the president made a commitment that they were going to ensure that they pass the petroleum industry bill. Petroleum industry bill has a section, section 23, though it's not yet passed, but has a session that captures uh, issues around contract transparency. So it became another opportunity for us to engage uh, parliament. Last week, we had a retreat with uh, some members of parliament. In fact, they came up with a communique, uh, making a very strong commitment to ensure that that provision of contract transparency in the petroleum industry bill would pass. They made that commitment. And then not only did we engage um, parliament at that meeting, we had another meeting for uh, uh, anti-corruption agencies. We had a meeting with the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit. We had a meeting with the EFCC, the ICPC, and Consumer Protection Agency, all of the anti-corruption agencies. At the end of that meeting too, they came up with a communique giving us a very strong commitment on their support for the implementation of, uh, of contract transparency. So it's it's been from one success to the other. And you know that the practice is that it's not just about making those commitments on paper. Civil society needs to push to ensure that those commitments are met. Now, this is what we have done to be able to get those commitments to translate to action. We wrote a letter to the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit to investigate a particular payment that was made and has continuously been made by the NMPC. And to look at the contracts, we were still waiting for them to get back to us. We have asked that they should do that. They have made a commitment that they are going to do that investigation. And so just to test, you know, find out if truly NMPC, our national oil company, um, truly because they have signed on to the EIT as a supporting uh, company, we, we use the freedom of information uh, uh, law and serve them. Just two weeks ago, we served them a freedom of information law, asking for a particular contract on uh, the supply of uh, petroleum products to the country. So we, 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 we are moving forward, ensuring that we are holding uh, the agencies uh, uh, to account. But you know, even with all of these success that I'm talking about, we still have a few uh, challenges. We still have a few challenges and that we think we can share. And, and part of what I've been asked to talk about is how should African uh, coalitions be organized effectively to argue for more contract uh, disclosure? I think collaboration is key. 
whether we like it or not, collaboration is key. And in collaborating, we should be able to have people who are knowledgeable about the issue. Now, there's been a lot of argument, even when we are advocating. Some of the agencies uh, came out even with Native were saying, oh, they have to be a definition of what should be disclosed and what should not uh, uh, be disclosed. So. And then they keep talking about, you know, there are certain things you shouldn't put in a contract. That we, we, we shared with them the findings from the NRGI study that uh, the, the busting the myth around the uh, contract transparency. Some of those issues around, oh, you know, the contract terms are not the same and so shouldn't uh, be disclosed. In fact, that is where the corruption starts. Because if you have contract terms that cannot be disclosed, it means there have been a certain under. Uh, that's the reason why those uh, contracts have, uh, have not uh, been, been, been disclosed. So in, in a nutshell, what we have done was to look at all of those um, information and then work as a loose network. We don't really have any structure to say we work as a loose network. You have, uh, I'm happy to say that some of the members of the network are really are on this meeting and it's been really uh, uh, helpful. We, I, I cannot talk about all of the things we have done. I just want to um, round up by talking about how more about what we should do in my presentation. I talked about strengthening capacity of state and non-state actors in understanding the extent of work to be done on contract transparency, supporting uh, civil society coalitions like publisher to pay to push for contract transparency adoption and implementation, supporting the uh, civil society, I think we should come up with a global advocacy strategy that can be shared across the region on how we want to uh, push that. And then for, to support that uh, strategy uh, to be done and building the capacity of extractive communities in the monitoring of contract terms and implementation, that is key. It's not enough to say, let's have access to the contract. We want to be able to monitor the implementation of that contract. And finally, to develop a comprehensive checklist for CS actors and citizens on standard contracts, especially for Africa, that's very important. Because the argument around the uh, around some of the people say, oh, you know, there are certain things we don't, you don't uh, disclose there are certain information. What should be the standard contract? What is it that we should be looking at? If we have a standard checklist that civil society can work on, that will really go a long way. Thank you again for the opportunity to do that. There's so much to share that because of uh, time, uh, I'll be stopping here and be happy to have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was again, very illuminating conversation and thanks for watching out for time. Um, we have about 20 minutes left for the session. I don't want to spend too much time uh, to take up any more time, uh, but I think it's important to just highlight what Faith has mentioned in terms of looking at the different stakeholders. Um, so not only looking at parliament and legislative assemblies, but also anti-corruption agencies, for example, as, as implementing uh, partners um, and strengthening the capacity of both state and non-state um, actors. I think that is critical. And I think one key thing that we are struggling with on the continent is we pass good laws, but then we forget about implementation. And I think that's something that Faith has sort of highlighted very well, that it doesn't matter what law you pass, um, ensuring that it's actually implemented and getting the commitment for that implementation is absolutely critical. Um, I want to jump straight to the Q&A question. Um, there's quite a few questions in the, in the box, so I'll just start. Um, I think my colleagues will help me with the French, French ones, uh, but I'll start with Robert from Uganda. Uh, and he asks, when does contract disclosure begin? Um, and he says Uganda was admitted in August last year, but does Uganda disclose contracts it signed before joining EITI or from the start date? Um, I think, Gay, I, I want you to take that question as well as a question from Charles Young, who asks, who monitors the EITI countries? Um, to actually ensure that disclosed contracts as noted in requirement 2.4. Um, Gay, I think we'll start with those two questions and then we'll move on. Right, thanks for the question. So um, on the first one, um, when, when is disclosure required? So as I mentioned earlier, for all contracts that will be executed after January 1, 2021, all those contracts have to be disclosed regardless of when the country joined the EITI. So if, for example, you know, like in the case of Uganda, um, 
you joined the EITI in, in 2020 before the, the requirement took effect, but the, the same reckoning period applies to you. So all contracts after 2021, uh, January 1st, 2021 should be disclosed, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, if there are amendments to contracts before January 1, 2021, those contracts also need to be disclosed. Um, and then on the second question of who is keeping track, um, that's a good question. So as many of you probably know, in the EITI, we do have um, a validation process, um, and uh, which is scheduled every three years. So every three years, a country will undergo uh, an assessment of all the requirements of the EITI standard. The board just agreed a new validation December last year, where contract transparency will already be assessed because it's not it's now a requirement and not just an encouraged provision. Now, you might think, well, three years, that's too long, that's not enough. But what I want to point out is that um, within those three years, countries also undergo what they call first validation, second validation, third validation, and that's in that comes in cycles. So there is a regular way of tracking progress um, in meeting this requirement not just every three years, but in the interim as well, depending on their validation cycle. So that's the assessment from the global level. Of course, there's also the, the, the assessment by the MSG at the country level that they are expected to do on an annual basis, right? So they're supposed to document the impact of EITI every year. Um, and they have to do that, um, yeah, um, on an annual basis and, and, and document that. So. I think that's also one way of keeping track um, of, of, this of meeting these requirements um, at, at the country level. And obviously, us at the Secretariat, we also keep track of that. Um, Faith, I'd like you to take this question. Uh, this Evans Rubara, who asks, I'm also wondering how contract transparency initiatives could be collabor collaboratively implemented between the CSOs and government agencies, such as the anti-corruption agencies. And what is the role of Transparency International on this? Okay, uh, thank you very much. You know, one thing that we, one of the challenges that we got when we are carrying out um, the initial research around uh, contract transparency was that we found that there was uh, little or no synergy between uh, existing government agencies. Everybody wants to reinforce the information that they have. They want to be the ones that have you know, access to that information. So, and um, we found that that the uh, anti-corruption agencies within their mandate can assess all of those uh, uh, organizations without really um, breaking the laws. So that, that was a strategy for us to engage the anti-corruption agencies. And at the meeting we had with them, if we had a, a two day meeting with them, we took them through all of that. And they came to understand that they needed to work with civil society to get that information. For instance, the letter we wrote to the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit was to ask them to investigate a particular contract. Now, civil society may not have uh, uh, information or get to that contract, but the NFIU as an anti-corruption agency under their mandate could do uh, that investigation. So we saw the link uh, between that and that's, uh, that's a strategy that's working. Uh, hopefully, by the time we get that feedback, we should be able to share that. And I think that's something we can put on the table and ask other people to try it out. Because really, when it comes to contract transparency, they just want to keep the information. But working with anti-corruption agencies, it makes it easier for civil society to assess. Thank you, uh, thank you Faith. Um, I wanted to give this question to uh, Rob. There's a few questions for you. Um, so Fatima, Mimbire, a coordinator from uh, Mozambique, um, it says that, uh, what about the trade contracts of the companies you mentioned, just the contract sales of the government? We know that the sales between the concessionaires and buyers agreements are not public. Even governments do not have access to them. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so so that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think, um, you know, I think that, Trading contracts of companies um, are clearly very interesting, and this is, um, you know, through the sales of um, of, 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 um, of of products, um, companies could, you know, potentially shift um, profits from high tax jurisdictions to low tax jurisdictions or out of host 
countries. So that is that is something that you know is a concern. Um, but you know, I think I think in terms of like how we deal with that, um, we're we're still not really made much progress when it comes to the trading contracts that that governments and SOEs um, um, are making. And I think that that's where we have probably the that's most at this moment. Um, yeah. And for that reason, you know, I I would start there, and then we can have this other conversation once we've once we've um, once we've got there. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, I want to direct this question to uh, to Christian um, Gloria Majiga from the coordinator from Malawi um, is asking: Contracts are negotiated behind closed doors, leaving little room for input from stakeholders. Are there any experiences of countries doing it differently, where engagement is before and not after signing, or any recommendations on how we can change um, future contracts? Euh, je pense que euh, généralement, je, je voulais relever deux choses. Euh, la première, une fois que les contrats sont déjà signés, si on n'a pas été suivi, ou si nous n'avions pas suivi la façon dont les contrats ont été, euh, comme qui dirait, euh, conçus, il est difficile de pouvoir justement euh, avoir un impact sur leur contenu. Et c'est pour ça que, euh, à mon sens, il serait euh, souhaitable que le travail de suivi des contrats euh, permette effectivement de les suivre avant même qu'ils ne soient signés, c'est-à-dire depuis même que euh, 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 l'entreprise est engagée, depuis que l'État et l'entreprise s'engagent dans la démarche. Je pense qu'il y a une aussi une autre perspective qui est importante de souligner, c'est le fait non seulement de regarder le contrat lui-même une fois qu'il est signé, mais c'est aussi de s'assurer le processus à travers lequel effectivement le contrat est passé jusqu'à ce qu'il est arrivé à sa signature. Et donc il y, a, il y a deux aspects, euh, l'aspect contractuel d'un côté, de l'autre côté, mais le processus à travers lequel effectivement le, projet, le, le, le contrat est signé. Et donc pour nous, euh, nous considérons qu'il est, qu est utile de, de tout mettre en œuvre pour obtenir que l'information soit publique, pendant que, euh, évidemment, la démarche en ce qui concerne Euh, 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 la, la signature des contrats et tout soit, soit, soit engagé et donc depuis euh, le lancement de l'initiative jusqu'à ce que euh, euh, comment dire le contrat est signé uh, Thanks Christian um, I'm cognizant of time we have about 10 minutes left um, and so I want to take in some questions that uh, have been asked um, just get them up, sorry. Um, so I'll, I'll ask all panelists to, to basically respond to some of the questions that are remaining. Um, and then, um, just another get it up, sorry. Uh, and then. Peut-être que euh, euh, je peux répondre et tout à travers un certain nombre de commentaires qui ont été faits. Euh, en ce qui concerne, par exemple, les défis euh, liés à la transparence des contrats, en particulier en ce qui concerne la société civile, je pense que euh, l'un des défis les plus importants euh, qui fait que euh, la société civile ne puisse pas participer euh, assez librement dans le processus qui est celui de, de contrat, il faut se souvenir que euh, la société civile elle-même n'est pas prise comme étant une partie prenante à part entière parce que la nature des questions qui, qui est traitée, les questions qui sont discutées euh, sont d'une sensibilité telle que, euh, évidemment, euh, parfois au niveau des États, on a l'impression que la société civile est une, euh, vient avec une présence autour d'une table qui, euh, sans invitation, comme qui dirait. Et donc, du coup, c'est un vrai défi d'obtenir que la société civile soit vue comme étant un acteur à part entière du processus. Je crois aussi que les aspects qui sont liés à l'espace civique euh, euh, sont utiles, D'autant que euh, si la société civile elle-même n'est elle pas indépendante, elle n'est pas libre, euh, si la société civile, euh, euh, comment dire, euh, euh, n'est pas du tout euh, libre pour pouvoir agir en tant que telle, il, y a, il peut y avoir des difficultés pour elle et tout de pouvoir in interagir en tant que partie prenante pour garantir que, euh, évidemment, les contrats soient transparents. Enfin, euh, une des questions qui a été posée liée à la participation de Transparency International en ce qui concerne 
les aspects qui sont liés au, à la transparence des contrats. Il faut dire que c'est une question que euh, Transparency International porte à un certain degré, d'autant qu'il euh, y a un travail particulier qui est fait en ce qui concerne euh, le suivi, par exemple, des flux financiers illicites, euh, d'une part, et, et également tout le plaidoyer qui est mené autour de euh, la propriété réelle également, qui, qui, qui est indépendant, effectivement, de cette démarche en ce qui concerne la transparence des contrats. Thanks, thanks, Christian. I want to combine a few questions and then I'll ask all the, the panelists to give their thoughts on, on the questions and sort of give their wrapping comments. Uh, we only have about eight minutes, so uh, I ask you to keep it brief. Um, the NDDOP asks about whether the, it's within the remit of EITI uh, to support civil society capacity building. Uh, Abu Bakrin speaks of um, whether the EITI can set up a mechanism to oblige all companies. Um, and so the, the interesting part of that question is around obliging the companies uh, to disclose. Um, and Miata Kona is asking around advocacy of contract transparency. And Charlotte um, had a question. And in Charlotte's question, um, I think I'll leave that to Rob. But let's start with Gay. Gay, can you answer the question around um, EITI's remit on, um, on capacity building and give us your final comments. Yes, thank you. So yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that is really something that we intend to, to do, you know, scale up our technical support to countries in building capacity. First on knowing what information to demand or include. Um, again, going back to the discussion on annexes uh, earlier um, and, and amendments, we really think that's a very important um, discussion to be had right now, especially you know with the COVID-19 pandemic and all the um, renegotiations or maybe you know understanding what are the tax reliefs that are being given to companies at this point. So we are um, providing that support at the country level. Um, we have also um, in, we also have in the pipeline some fiscal modeling um, studies in some countries. Um, and if you want to know more about that, um, I advise you to reach out to your country managers because obviously the that also entails examination of contracts. So contract disclosure is also important in you know understanding um, fiscal uh, for revenue forecasts uh, rather. Um, so that's one thing that we are prioritizing um, for this year. And then um, I guess as a concluding remark, um, again, you know, it's, it's very good to see that there's a lot of momentum around this discussion right now. Um, but if there's one takeaway that um, we really want to emphasize, it's that uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and, you know, again, just to highlight um, what Rob mentioned earlier about just the issue of comprehensiveness of contract, I think is very important to make. Um, it's, it's a bit um, concerning that there are really countries who do not even know the universe, you know, the full scope of contracts that exist in their countries. Um, I think that's the first step, a key step um, in trying to make sure that we are looking at meaningful disclosures. Um, and also, again, going back to the issue on linking this work to other emerging issues um, in the extractive sector. So again, energy transition, beneficial ownership, anti-corruption, how do, how do all these things fit together? I think um, there's still work to be done, you know, to, to try to understand um, how contract disclosure contributes to other national reforms. And last year, we, we hosted um, a webinar on the links of contract transparency to domestic resource mobilization mobilization. I know there's a lot of interest in that. So again, that's another um, policy issue where we also want to deepen our engagement with countries. So I'll, I'll end there. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I wanted you Can to. You hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, no, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, please. 
No, I just said, I, okay, I wanted you um, to- Okay, just uh, as- Sorry. <laughs> Please go ahead. Charles, you wanted me to speak on something specific? I just wanted you to respond to uh, Marie's question on, so after disclosure of contracts, um, I think Marie and DI speaks that these contracts may be complicated. Um, and how does the EITI provide for dissemination of contracts to communities? I wanted you to speak to that, but from the civil society point of view of how do you disseminate contracts once they are disclosed? Yeah, if uh, when, when I was uh, speaking earlier, I talked about um, working with communities, people who live within extractive communities to for, first and foremost, understand what they should be looking at for. And that's why that checklist is very important. If we can have a checklist of what people should be looking at for, it makes it easier for civil society to work with communities so that when contracts are disclosed, it helps for the implementation. And, and your parting thoughts? Uh, okay, I just want to say that um, contract transparency, for a long time we fought to have contract transparency and now we have it. We need to push further because it's not enough for us to campaign and ask that contract transparency should be added as one of the EIT requirements. Now we have it. It is now that we time for us to roll up our sleeves and make sure that we get it. Because during the meeting with the anti-corruption agencies in Nigeria, they said they were going to work and civil society told them we are coming to knock. And you know, because we are demand their supply, if there's no demand, there's no supply. So my charge to all of us today is that we must demand. And that's the only thing that can get us supply for the contracts, uh, the, uh, uh, contract transparency to be implemented. Thank you once again for the opportunity to share. Thank you, thank you Faith. Christian, your... Your thoughts on any questions and um, your final thoughts, please. You need to unmute. Question, you're muted. The question that has been posed on the aspects that are related to the role of the parliamentary. Euh, J'ai simplement euh, envie euh, de rebondir pour dire que euh, les parlementaires effectivement ont un rôle central qu'ils doivent jouer dans cette dynamique euh, de comment dire de transparence des contrats. D'autant que euh, en pensant à l'exemple du Congo, euh, les contrats sont des lois qui sont passées et qui sont votées par les parlementaires. Alors, euh, la question euh, ou le commentaire que je voulais faire, c'est rappeler simplement qu'il euh, faut déjà que les parlementaires aient en conscience, effectivement, euh, euh, le rôle là, qui est le leur. Puis c'est eux qui votent, puisqu'on a vu dans des parlements euh, au niveau africain que euh, les parlementaires peuvent être amenés à voter tout et n'importe quoi et pas du tout ce qu'on aurait souhaité qu'effectivement euh, ils, ils votent. C'est pour ça qu'il faut sensibiliser les parlementaires, il faut les amener à, à, à pouvoir intégrer le fait qu'ils ont un pouvoir et qu'à partir de leur pouvoir, il y a des possibilités de franchir un pas important en ce qui concerne cette problématique euh, justement de, 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 de transparence des contrats. Et dans notre cas, nous avons travaillé avec eux pour obtenir que euh, le code de transparence et de responsabilité dans la gestion des ressources publiques et tout soit adopté et on a vu à ce moment-là qu'ils ont joué un rôle et je pense qu'il est utile de continuer à, à les entretenir, à les sensibiliser pour qu'ils aient davantage un peu plus que ce qu'ils n'ont fait déjà. Je crois aussi que la société civile doit poursuivre son rôle de plaidoyer, son rôle de sensibilisation pour pouvoir amener effectivement les pouvoirs publics à se rappeler qu'ils ne doivent pas s'arrêter justement à à faire des publications de, 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 comment dire, des publications, juste pour des publications, mais les, les publications qui doivent être faites doivent tenir compte de, des aspects qui sont liés à l'exhaustivité, mais aussi euh, des aspects qui permettent à la communauté de pouvoir interagir sur les contacts qui sont publiés à partir du moment où ces communautés sont capables de pouvoir accéder, de comprendre, de pouvoir lire et de pouvoir interpréter ces contrats-là. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Christian. Rob, um, you have just under a minute. Okay, I'm going to be super quick. So I just want to answer Charlotte's question in the Q&A. Um, Charlotte asked, um, um, given 
well, given the energy transition and all these issues, um, wouldn't it make sense to um, be able to um, uh, scrutinize um, contract terms before they're agreed? Um, just on this point, I think it's a really interesting point. Um, would probably not advocate for public involvement in the negotiation um, process because that opens up a whole can of worms that we can probably discuss at another point. But what I would say is that um, it is really key for governments to clearly lay out um, what terms are for negotiation um, and minimize the number of terms for negotiation and that they stick then to the, the, the stipulations that they've laid out. And publishing contracts um, is um, the, the main way that you guarantee that you, you have stuck to what you said you were gonna negotiate on and not, not gone off on other sort of random things. So, that's, that's quickly answering Charlotte's question. And then in terms of my overall sort of um, parting comment, this answers a number of other comments that were, were also made about sort of how we, um, you know, what, what does it entail to, to update the way we talk about contract transparency for the energy transition. And here, I just wanna say that the, the, the key is that we, uh, we need to be switching the way that we talk about contracts and that we question contracts moving away from questions about how much can we get from these projects um, to questions about what are the risks and rewards that are embedded within these contracts and how are these distributed between um, citizens and companies. And that's, that's really like what our, um, our sort of frame of analysis should be pivoting towards. Thank you very much. And it's been such a great panel and seeing such great other experts on this on this group so i um, really really enjoyed it um, thank you all um i think thanks to a, an amazing uh, uh panel um i want to hand over to the publish what you pay secretariat now for the next uh sorry we weren't able to get to all the questions thanks everyone for attending uh, we just have one more final session today on energy transition this begins at one uh, thank you. And there is a link to a survey in the chat. So if you could also fill that out, that would be amazing. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.